This is part 2 of how to make a magical repair effect in Unity. If you haven't seen part 1, then feel free to pause the video and go check it out. Link is in the video description. And now, without further ado, have fun with part 2. Okay, let's just quickly recap what we did in part 1. We created a stunning 3D model, put its center point at the bottom and duplicated it. Slice the duplicate into smaller pieces and created individual objects out of each piece. Then we parented all the individual pieces to one empty object and further grouped the pieces into rows by creating three empty child objects and called them row 1, 2 and 3. And then parent the corresponding pieces to these rows. And finally we gave each individual piece a new center point, depending on the geometry, and set off the model center point at the bottom. We did this to make them be able to spin around themselves instead of the original model's center point. And that's it. And with that, let's hop into Unity. In Unity, I set up a small scene with just a green plane and the new skybox material. Then I dragged the two models into the Unity project and first placed the unharmed model into the scene and afterwards the broke model with the exact same transform parameters as our unharmed model. For keyboard inputs, I use Unity's input system, but you can use whatever you like. Okay, now before we go on, let's recap first what we need to do in order to create this magical repair effect. So the basic idea to create this effect is that we're going to first make an object explode and then record the movement of its parts and save them into an animation clip. Afterwards, we're going to change the animation clip in a way to play the animation backwards, but with a little bit of rotation to make it a bit more magical. So let's start with creating our explosion. To do that, we need to go to a broken model and give each broken piece a rigid body. You can change the properties to whatever you like. I'm just gonna leave it like that. And then also give each piece a mesh collider, so that each collider is based on the shape of each individual piece. And don't worry too much about performance here, because later on we're going to remove all the mesh colliders and all the rigid bodies again. So as long as your PC can handle the physics calculations of just the broken pieces and the ground, you're going to be fine. Okay, now let's just disable the 3D model game object, which contains the unhumped model, and test the physics of our broken pieces. Well, let's see what Unity has to say about that. So what this means is, because we want to use non-kinematic rigid bodies, so in our case dynamic rigid bodies, that are affected by forces like for example gravity or collisions with other objects, we cannot use non-convex mesh colliders. Here's an example of the difference between convex and non-convex shapes. In a convex mesh, when you draw a straight line between any two points inside the mesh, the line itself will always stay inside the mesh. But with a non-convex shape, there are points that when connected by a straight line, the line will dip out of the mesh before re-entering to connect to the other point. So Unity doesn't want these kind of shapes for non-kinematic objects. Meaning that if you have something like this for example, which is clearly non-convex, you would have to set its rigid body to kinematic, so that others may interact with it. But this is not an option for us, because we want our object to be affected by physics. So what we can do is we can check here to confirm that we only want to have convex mesh colliders. This means if our mesh is convex, the mesh collider will be like our mesh. But if we use non-convex meshes, Unity will help us create a convex mesh collider to fit our mesh instead. Like this. Okay, so let's do this for our project. I'm going to select all the individual pieces and check convex, so that each piece gets a convex mesh collider. And let's see if it works now. Okay, great. Hey, just a quick clarification. You've probably noticed that when running our project, our broken 3D model already starts to fall apart, at least partially. This is because of Unity's generated convex mesh colliders for our non-convex meshes. You see, when we have for example two non-convex meshes that are intertwined like this and let Unity now create convex mesh colliders, then what will happen is that both colliders will overlap and therefore, when we run our project, both pieces will push themselves away from each other, which will result in something like this. But for our case, this is not too much of an issue, because we're going to make our pieces explode. But if you want to avoid this kind of behavior, then you would need non-convex mesh colliders, which Unity does not provide for dynamic objects. So what do we do now? One workaround could be that since you can give a game object more than one collider, you could build or approximate a non-convex collider by combining multiple convex colliders. To do that, you could for example use Unity's provided collider shapes or use Blender to create individual convex colliders for each piece. If you are interested in seeing this process in more detail, then let me know in the comments below. Maybe I'll do a video on that. 
Okay, now that we talked about that, I'd say let's continue with our explosion. Now that each piece has a rigid body and a collider, we can finally start with the coding part of this tutorial and make our 3D model explode. To do that, I'm going to create an explosion manager script and give it the private game object variable for our unham 3D model and also for our broke model. And finally, a private rigid body array to hold all the rigid bodies of our individual broken pieces. You can see here that I gave them all the serialized field attribute at the beginning. With this attribute, we can on one hand leave our variables private and on the other hand are still able to see and set them in the editor, which we will do now. So let's set our unhumped 3D model, our broken one, and finally we select each broken piece and drag them into the array. Now let's write the public void start explosion function that will first disable our unhump model and then enable our broken one. Now to make our pieces fly away, we need to get through each rigid body of our array and add an explosion force with the value of the force, the explosion position and the explosion radius. You can see here that instead of a vector 3 variable for our explosion position, I use a transform variable. This is because in the editor, I'm going to create an empty explosion position game object and set it as a reference to our explosion manager script. With that, we can just move our explosion by just moving our empty game object and so make it easier for us to test our explosions. Now in the editor, let's disable our broken model and instead enable our unhump one so that we first see our unhump model and when we want to destroy it, we switch to our broken one and let it explode. And to finish our preparations, let's set some initial values for our explosion radius and our explosion force. Now to test our explosion and find the right one, we're going to write an explosion test manager script that gets a reference to our explosion manager and waits for our keyboard input to start the explosion by calling the start explosion function of our explosion manager. And now we can test our explosion and tweak it to our liking. But just so you know, the values I'll choose for my explosion here may not work for you because depending on your model and on the parameters you choose for the rigid bodies, your explosion can look completely different using these values. So find an explosion that suits your model. And for that, I'm going to show you my finding process so you can adopt it for your project. Okay, then let's go. Hmm, not enough force. Let's go a bit higher. Better, but maybe a little bit more force. Okay, whoa, way too much. Let's dial it back to 800. I don't want this group here to just shoot straight up. So maybe changing the radius will do the trick. It's still not what I want. So let's reset it again to 3. And instead of increasing the radius to reach the top rigid bodies, we could just move our explosion position a bit up. Moving up the explosion helped, but it still looks a bit rough. I think maybe using two explosions will do the trick. A bottom explosion that moves everything up and the higher explosion that loosens the upper part a bit. So to do that, I'm going to duplicate the explosion position object and move one to the bottom and one slightly up. Now, what we need to do is we need to change our explosion test manager script to allow more than one explosion. For that, we're going to change our position force and radius variables into arrays. And also in our for loop, since we now have an array of explosion positions, we need to add an explosion for each explosion position in our array with the corresponding force and radius. I'm going to use hard-coded array positions here, because I know that I'm only going to use two explosions in this tutorial. But for more flexibility, if you are unsure how many explosions you're going to end up with, you could use a second for loop that calls the add explosion function depending on the size of the explosion position array. And in the editor, let's set both explosion positions as references and give each position an individual force and radius. Okay, so now we have two explosion positions, a lower one and a higher one, that we can tweak individually to fine-tune the explosion even more. And after a bit more testing, I ended up with these values, which gives us this. Nice, we're done creating our explosion. What we want to do now is to record the explosion and save it into an animation clip. And to do that, we're going to use something called the Game Object Recorder. The Game Object Recorder can, as the name suggests, record the changing properties of a game object and save these informations in an animation clip. And that's exactly what we want. Let's look at the example script Unity provides us here to see how it's done. 
Here we have a public class called Record Transform Hierarchy that has two properties. A public animation clip that we will set in the editor and in the end will contain our recorded animation and our game object recorder. In the start function we create our recorder with a reference to our game object we want to record and set what exactly should be recorded. Here it is the transform parameters of the game object and all its children. Now in late update we only continue here if our animation clip is not null, meaning that we have for example set it already in the editor. If that's the case, our recorder will take a snapshot and record and save all the current transform parameter values. And finally, when we disable the script, we check again if the clip is not null. And if so, it will save all the recorded values to the animation clip. And that's it. So let's just copy the whole example code because it does exactly what we want and let's head back to our project. Back in Unity, we're going to create the record transform hierarchy script for our broken 3D model game object. Then we open it, delete everything and paste the example code from the Unity documentation. Now, before we continue, let me just quickly organize my assets folder a bit. There. Now let's create an empty animation clip called Explosion Clip and give it to our Record Transform Hierarchy script so that it can save the explosion animation to this fresh empty animation clip. Now in our Explosion Manager script we don't have to add much. Our Start Explosion function for example is already fine as it is. Because not only does it start our explosion, but it also starts our recording. Because by simply enabling our broken 3D model game object, we will also enable the attached Transform Hierarchy script that will do the recording until we disable our broken 3D model game object. What we can do is to maybe rename our start explosion function here to start explosion and recording, so that it better represents what it's actually doing now. And of course, we also have to change the name of the function call in our explosion test manager script to its new name. Back in our explosion manager, the only thing we really have to add is a way to stop the recording. For that, I'm going to write a public void stop recording function that just disables our broken 3D model game object and therefore stops our recording. And finally, in our test explosion manager script, we're going to use another keyboard input to call the stop recording function. In my case, I'm starting the explosion and the recording by pressing and holding the A key down. And when releasing it, it will stop the recording. But feel free to use whatever way you like to start and stop your recording. Okay, enough with that. Let's finally record our explosion. I'm going to press the explosion key, hold it down until the explosion is finished and then release it to stop the recording, which is indicated by our game object being disabled. If we now look into our animation clip, we see that, yes, all the transform parameters of our broken pieces have been recorded to this clip. Now we only have to check if it really recorded everything correctly. To do that, we give our broken 3D model game object an animator. Then we create an animator controller, let's call it repair effect animator and give it to our animator. Now let's enable our broken 3D model game object and disable our unhumped one so that we can see our animation. Now open up the Repair Effect Animator and drag the animation clip into it. Open the animation clip and select our broken 3D model game object. And we see that our explosion was thankfully recorded correctly. Nice! Now that we know that we can play our explosion as an animation, we don't need to create a real explosion anymore. So let's make some changes to our project. First, let's delete the Record Transform Hierarchy script component, because we already recorded our explosion and don't want to overwrite our current animation clip. And now, since we don't want to calculate explosions anymore, but rather use the animation clip to play the recorded animation, we can delete all our explosion position game objects, as well as the rigid bodies and colliders from all our broken pieces in the editor. In our explosion manager, we can now delete the for loop in which we added the explosion forces to our rigid bodies, and also the arrays that hold the explosion forces, the positions, the radii and the rigid bodies of our broken pieces. And since we don't record anything anymore, we can delete our stop recording function. And also rename our start explosion and recording function back to just start explosion. And finally, just to be sure that the correct game object is visible in the beginning, we're going into our start function and then enable our unarmed model and disable our broken one. So now we don't have to worry about whether they are enabled or disabled in the editor. And that's it for the explosion manager. Let's now head to our explosion test manager script and delete the part where we call the stop recording function and also rename the start explosion and recording function back to just start explosion. And that should be it. Let's test now if everything works as expected. I'm going to press the explosion key and nice, it works. And some of you may ask now, how is this even possible? We only just deleted half of our self-written code. And our start explosion function does nothing but deactivate our unarmed 3D model game object and activate our broken 3D model game object. 
And that's the thing. Activating our game object will trigger the explosion animation. And that is because when we look at the repair effect animator, we see that the explosion clip is our default state of our animator. This means that whenever we are activating the animator, or in our case the game object that has the animator as a component, the animator will always go to the default state and therefore start our explosion. But if for example you want something else to happen before our explosion clip plays, you could create a new state with a new animation clip and set this new state as the default state. And then transfer to the explosion clip afterwards, either automatically or after a certain condition has been met. But we want our explosion clip as our default state, so let's go back to that. Great, now we have everything we need to create the actual magical repair effect. Ok, so to create this magical repair effect, let's first copy our explosion clip and rename it to repair clip. And then drag it into our animator. You can see here that both clips are the same animation, since we just created a copy of the same clip. But we want this one here to run backwards, so to accomplish that we need to head to our animator, select the repair clip state and then change the speed in which our animation is played to a negative value. Setting it to minus 1 for example will let our animation clip run at the normal speed but backwards. Ok, now all we need to do now is to connect our state with our other state via a transition. So for this tutorial I want to first have my 3D model explode and after it has finished exploding I want to automatically start the repairing process. So for that I'm going to right click on my explosion clip state and select make a transition. And then click on my repair clip state. And that's it. Now let's see if everything works as intended. Ok, so first our explosion. And then, yes, our animation clip runs backwards and creates our basic magical repair effect. But I kinda wanted to repair a bit faster, so I'm going to set our speed to minus 1.5 to increase the speed by 50%. And let's take a look at the result. Nice. And this concludes part 2 of this tutorial. Do you like this tutorial so far? Then why not give this video a thumbs up and let me know. I would really appreciate it. And thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you all again in part 3. Until then, ciao! Hello again! Ready for part 3 of this tutorial? Then you can check it out here. And for other tutorials feel free to check out this playlist. Maybe you can find something interesting for you. Ok then, part 3 is waiting for me. So, hope to see you all there. Bye!